a political expert whose work focuses on crucial issues facing Nevada and the country, David DeMore, Interim Executive Director of the Lindsay Institute and Brookings Mountain West, joins us this week for Nevada Week in person. Support for Nevada Week in person is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week in Person. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. Having written extensively on Nevada politics and policy, he is a go-to source for local, national, and international news outlets, especially during election season. In addition to overseeing two public policy research centers at UNLV, he's also a political science professor and chair of the Department of Political Science at UNLV. David Moore, thank you for being on Nevada Week in person. Thanks for having me. So election night, I'm sitting around my house, 8 p.m., flipping through network coverage of the election, and it's Nevada and Alaska with no results to report. And I'm thinking it was Friday when early voting ended. Why wasn't there anything to report? Well, you had the polls closing very late, right? So that's, you know, the rule in the law in Nevada is we can't even start looking at the ballots until the last poll closes, and that was a very late one up at the UNR campus. Um, so that further. <laughs> and then, you know, we have so much mail now, and that takes much, much longer to process. Um, so, you know, the downside is, yeah, a lot of interest in it and a lot of frustration um, with, with the, 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 the re release of the results, um, but that's our process now. And Nevada has got this reputation now as a mail-in ballot state. It's going to take long in Nevada. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the mail-in ballot process here and its utilization in the state? Well, I mean, any, any opportunity to get more people to vote, I think, is, is a plus. Um, we're following, we're not the first state to do this. You have other states that have been doing it for a while. We're just now sort of getting up to speed on it. Um, so that's certainly there. But what I think is obviously interesting is the partisan dynamic involved in this, right? That the Democrats are much more likely to use mail balloting. We saw that in 2020. It's carried forward in 2022. Republicans much more likely to vote in person, particularly on election day. So now we're polarizing on how we even cast our votes. And this used to not be an issue. Well, it used to be much easier, right? I mean, so much of what the vote was in on early voting. You had a pretty good idea where the party stood at that point. Um, much smaller election day turnout and then you know we would often by the end of the day know because we had very little mail, very little provisional voting um, to count there. That, that's now shifted. In addition to what you just talked about with the uh, partisan aspect to the mail-in voting, what else intrigues you about Nevada politics? Well, the, the part that is so interesting is the electorate here is always churning, right? Because of our population growth, because of the changing demography, you really know, don't know what the election is going to look like from one cycle to the next. Um, we saw this, you know, during COVID, so many Southern Californians moving into Southern Nevada, Northern, Northern Californians moving into Reno. What was that going to do to the balance of power there? Clearly, the rise in nonpartisans, that's a big issue in Nevada. Not, and, of course, across the West, we're seeing that as well here. So the electorate here is always reinventing itself. And so it keeps you busy. It keeps busy trying to keep up with the demographic change. And you see from cycle to cycle the action and reaction, right? So the Democrats had had a strong part earlier in the decade. 2020, COVID, not as much GOTV that they were doing. And the Republicans really stepped into that space. You saw Clark... Uh, go a little more Republican that time around here, but then up in Washoe, right, goes a little more blue. So it's, a, it's very interesting to watch the state dynamic. The only constant is the rural part of the state that votes above its population share and overwhelmingly Republican. The book that you co-authored on that topic, the difference between rural and urban voting, what did you learn from that? Well, so the Blue Metro's Red State is, is a book that we did looking, obviously, at the, the partisan dimension of that as well as the policymaking dimensions of that and looking at sort of the tension and we look at 13 swing states and all the big million-plus metros in there. And the dynamics in every state are a little bit different. One of the fun parts of that book is we got to interview experts in, in each of their states to get a little sense of the history and how we got there. And you see some states, um, you know, particularly where the state capital is located in the biggest city, they tend to do much better in terms of policy making. Um, whereas a state like Nevada, where we have this sort of distant, remote state government, um, not a lot of local, lo local government authority here, a lot of fragmentation here, we see policy making is not so cohesive. So that was sort of what we were looking at. And obviously looking at that sort of balance of power, for can we find that space, that geographic space where tips one state to the other? 
And obviously what you're seeing, one of the things that we found in the, in the, in the book in the sort of projecting to 2020 was every state where a, one metro region counts for more than half of the state's population, Joe Biden won them. Mm. So you know, flipped Phoenix, fl flips Arizona because of Maricopa, flipped it, uh, Georgia because of Atlanta. So you see this sort of metro cohesion, whereas in a state like Florida, fragmented with, four, you know, in Texas, same way, even in Ohio, it, it's much more fragmented. You see much less cohesion within the metros. So sort of to tease out, is that sort of an artifact or is that something important there? And you even saw this, I think, looking at the Georgia races, right? The suburbs there voting for Kemp for governor, a lot of defection to, uh, to, to Warnock in those races. How long have you been in Nevada now? 22 years. All right, coming from? California, Northern okay. California. And that is where, well, University of California, Davis, you got your PhD, mm -hmm. MA from the University of Georgia, uh -huh. BA from the University of California, San Diego, all in political science. How and when did you get interested in <laughs> politics? I'm thinking there was maybe a race when you were a little no, boy that. It was my grandfather, tell yeah? you the truth. He okay. was, uh, I grew up in Modesto, California. He was in Sacramento. Um, he was involved in local government there, a uh, diehard Roosevelt Democrat, but really got me interested in politics and history and, you know, really hated Nixon. And uh -huh. so, the, so the first books I read were all the Watergate books um, during high school. I was like the nerd reading the Watergate books. Um, and I figured, you know, I'll go to law school. My older brother went to law school, and I said, I'm going to go to law school. Um, so then I really you know, so I got to, you oh, know, I can do this. And I liked, you know, the idea of like, being a fact professor, doing research, working with data, and... Here I am. What was it about law school that turned you off? <laughs> uh, that's what's a law school, the life of a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the constant billing, you're not getting to choose your cases, you know, just sort of the grind of being a day-to-day -day lawyer did not seem that appealing. In October of last year, you took on the interim executive director of two public policy research centers at UNLV, the Lindsay Institute and Brookings Mountain West. That was following the passing of the revered Robert Lang, who held that executive director role uh, prior to his passing in June 2021 due to cancer. You worked together on a lot. What is uh, his legacy in this state. Oh, tremendous. I mean, you know, I had the privilege of working with Rob for a decade um, and just watch him. He came in here coming out of the, the, the Great Recession. Southern Nevada's kind of looking around, what's next? Are we going to keep trying to do the same thing over and over? And, you know, he brought that national perspective coming from back east, sort of saying, looking, this is what you need to do. The first thing they did was the economic development plan, restructured economic development. Um, figured out where we can compete for, for new business, um, and most importantly, found out what assets we are missing in this region, things like Allegiant Stadium, the connection Interstate 11 to Phoenix, um, an R1 institution, a medical school, all those sort of lists that he came in, and these are things that we need to build, and then watching and working with him over that last decade to sort of realize that vision. When you talk about uh, the Great Recession and the need to diversify, the Las Vegas economy away from gaming and tourism because of such reliance on it. Was he really the first to introduce that concept? Not really, but okay. he was the first to bring some metrics to it. Okay. Um, you know, it's easy to say we need to do this, we need to do this, but to make the comparisons, um, why are we getting our clock clean by Phoenix? Why can't we compete with, with, with Salt Lake City? Um, what are our advantages being so proximate to California? Um, and really sort of identifying those sort of assets that we just did not hear have for a city this big. Um, and that was a really, really big part of it there, um, figuring out where we can be, and even in gaming and in, in, in tourism, how can we sort of expand that into sports? So, you know, one of the big voices for Allegiant Stadium. Um, and a lot of people said, no, no, that's just a boondoggle, but I don't think anybody thinks that was a dumb idea now. We'd become an NFL team, right, have the capacity to host large events on the Strip. For our perspective, is also a way that we can invest our own Southern Nevada resources into an asset that would essentially help us build our economy. What have you found to be the most pressing issue of Nevada right now through your research? Oh, governance. I mean, we still govern like we're 1800s here. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, you look at a legislature that meets every two years, 120 days. Okay, if you want that, then you probably should have some local government power. We have neither. Right, so that sort of tensions, right? And you know, we've been advocates for higher ed governance reform for a long time. How do we not have local power? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it's a great question. Um, some of it is, you know, it always comes to the capacity of to actually make these changes, right? Because all of it has to come, you know, a lot of it's in the Constitution, right? So you change in the Constitution here is not easy. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of the people who control that process, control the status quo, they don't want to change it, right? So I've gone up there to Carson City, talked to legislators, and they're like, well, you know, we're kind of a weak branch, and we have, one of the powers we do have is over local government, so we don't want to give that up. But it puts it as, us at a real competitive disadvantage. Um, we're not nimble. Our local governments have to wait two years to get their bills heard. Um, it's very, very tough structure there. You look at the county-based um, school district, right? There's a lot, you know, may work with the rest of Nevada, probably isn't a great model for, for, for Southern Nevada. Um, people are finally sort of getting that. Um, because nice it's thing, just too big. It's just too big, right? You, you have the core of Las Vegas, Moapa Valley, Mesquite, Boulder City, all one school district, right? You think about it, we're like the 28th largest metro and we're the fifth biggest school district. There's some sort of mismatch in there. Um, so we're, you know, and what we do find is when we do reform, seems to work out well, right? Economic development, and I don't think anybody wants to go back to the old model, right? This idea of a medical school in Southern Nevada was seen as ridiculous and preposterous by the, some of the folks up north, but I don't think anybody thinks it's a dumb idea now. Imagine what we would have been like during COVID without our medical school. Mm. And that was another... That good. was a great, yeah, that was one of Rob's big initiatives, and that comes from the Kikorian estate, right? Kikorian is a state that funds Lindsay, right? They want healthcare fixed in Southern Nevada, and that's why their name's on the building. Do you find some of what you are proposing gets that feedback of, no, you're crazy? <laughs> Less so now, um, you know, because I think people realize, you know, we've kind of grown up a little bit since the Great Recession a little bit, I'd like to, th I like to think. Um, you have you know, sort of a transition in leadership, new people coming on who are less tied to sort of the old ways of doing things there. Um, so I, I don't think there's a resistance, right? I think everybody sees like the Las Vegas Medical District. Well, that seems like a no-brainer. Las Vegas tried to create that decades ago, and now it's finally getting that momentum. Um, so I think people sort of see that. You're seeing, I think, people are real, real frustrated with Clark County School District. You know, one of the things I noticed in the data is that there are only two-thirds of all the public school students we should if everybody was enrolled, it would be over 75% of the state. Mm -hmm. So people are leaving with their feet. They're going to privates. They're going to charters. They're going to homeschooling there. So there's a lot of frustration with these structures. In your personal life, uh, I have heard about the idea that your political leanings will change as you age or if there's a <laughs> life event like you get married or you have a kid. Have you found that to be the case in your life? A little bit. I would say I've just become much more geographically focused. Rob, that was Rob, was obviously a big geography person, right? Uh, an economic geographer. Um, and I never was much more of a temporal time series type of person looking at how, how things uh, overfold, unfold dynamically. Um, but I really look at politics now through the lens of where I live, right? And so, you know, I vote south, right? And so partisanship complicates geographic voting and it's an interesting puzzle to, to, try, to, uh, to try to unlock. Mm, can you can you further explain that <laughs> in right, thirty so, seconds? Yes, yeah, so I mean I mean uh, parties are the organizing principle of American politics here, but you know politicians represent specific spaces on the map, and one of the reasons that we struggle in Southern Nevada compared to say Northern Nevada is our politics are less cohesive. Um, so thinking about ways like things like the Southern Nevada Forum, for example, was a creation to try to get people to think regionally here. Um, some of that is also goes to the governance problem. We have very fragmented governments in Southern Nevada, a lot of competition, less collaboration. David Damore, I gotta cut you off there. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for joining us for Nevada Week in person. To see more as well as this week's edition of Nevada Week, go to VegasPBS.org slash Nevada Week.